gather in this space as God's people, and we do so using responsive call to worship. Won't you join me? How wonderful it is to be in a dwelling place for God. The refreshing springs of God's love cleans and restores us. There is a place here for everyone. No one is turned away. The least and the lost, the homeless and the hopeless, are always welcome in God's house. Praise to God who invites and shelters us all. Praise to God who heals and sends us forth to serve. And we rise together and sing God this morning. And God welcomes us to this place with these words, grace and peace to you in abundance from the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, the peace of Christ be with you. You may be seated. Even as we sing, O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, we often find ourselves turning away from God and not paying attention to God like we claim we want to. We do not invest in that relationship. And so we take a moment now to confess those moments. We confess together using the prayer of confession found in our bulletin or on the screen. Wondrous God, you are the one who holds the past, the present, and the future in your hands. You created all things and invite us to dwell in your presence, to find a home with you. Yet we often get stuck in the current moment, letting one experience determine our next step, or a single issue determine our tomorrows. We forget that you hold all the pieces. We forget that you are the author of our stories. We forget that you offer us belonging in your places. Forgive us for narrowing our focus to the present moment and not remembering that you journey with us all the days of our lives. Forgive us for ignoring your presence rather than dwelling in it.
gracious God, empower us by your Holy Spirit. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Friends, we are loved by the God who was, who is, and who is to come. Go forth and live in that peace. We now invite the children forward for a word with Lizzie. Good morning, Sawyer. All right. Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you. Welcome to church. Now, this morning at church, we are going to hear a psalm, or from the book of Psalm. That's spelled P-S-A-L-M. Have you heard that before? Do you know what a psalm, what does that kind of sound like? Psalm. It sounds kind of like song, doesn't it? You're right. Yes, when we hear psalms, we can think of them as songs or prayers that people wrote a long time ago. What is neat about this um, book of psalms is that there are songs and prayers for every kind of feeling. So some are sad. Some are happy. Some might make you cry or dance, or jump up and down. Some are about despair and depression, and some ask big questions like, where are you, God? And some psalms thank God for all of God's goodness. Music is a great way to express our feelings. <laughs> all right, so this morning I'm wondering, if you can help me express some feelings. Have you ever listened to some songs that make you wiggle? Do some songs make you dance really fast? Or some might make you dance a little slow? I'm gonna play a few songs and I'm wondering if you can dance with me this morning. All right, listen to this song and stay seated, but I wanna see how they make you feel, okay? Are you ready? Here's our first one. It makes you feel happy. Yeah, that's a good one. All right. I have another one for us. How does that one make you feel? Mad. Mad. <gasps> That's a good one. Okay. Let's see. This one you might know. A dream is a wish your heart makes when I see you smiling. Does this one make you happy? And feel loved and alive. Yeah? Okay. Let's see. I have one last one here for us. I want to know how this one makes you feel. Are you ready to dance? You ready?
You're right, Ashley. That one makes you want to move and groove and maybe punch something. <laughs> or get all pumped up, right? Those songs make us feel a lot of different ways. And you can dance and move. And sometimes music helps your feelings. It's a good way to express yourself. So this morning, as we listen to a song that's spoken from the book of Psalms, pay attention to how it makes you feel. Is the rhythm of the words really fast? <sighs> or are they really slow and lovey? All right, pay attention to how our song this morning makes you feel. Let's pray. Hey God, we thank you so much for music and for your words that we can find in the book of Psalms. May they provide comfort and express all of our feelings. God, we thank you that we can bring all of our feelings to you. We love you, God, and we thank you for who you are and who you've made us to be. And all God's children said, Amen. As the children go back to their seats, we prepare to hear God's word by rising together and singing, I love you, Lord. Seated. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. This morning, may your word be both of those, both lamp and light, to illuminate our lives, to illuminate our hearts, to illuminate our minds and our souls. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Kristen Brower, and I come to you from Northwestern College. In June, I started as the, the Director of Discipleship. And thank you for that children's message this morning, Lizzie. I can't ever say that there was, like, walk-up music to preach, but I felt like that's sort of what it was this morning. Um, so, so that's a preaching first. <laughs> In talking to Rose about the passage that I wanted to share with you this morning, I suggested Psalm 84. And I landed on Psalm 84 because Psalm 84 was one of my grandmother's favorite psalms. And, and this is a picture of my grandmother. When I moved back to Orange City in 2013, one of the gifts of moving back was I was able to spend a lot of time with my grandmother in her last years. And every time I would go over to her house or I would visit her in the hospital, she would always ask, would you read Psalm 84? Um, what is really sweet is that my grandmother was a member at Alton Reformed Church uh, 
and she had Pastor Mike and Pastor Elizabeth as her pastors, which was also huge in my own journey uh, to seminary uh, as a pastor. So it's really meaningful to preach Psalm 84 uh, here this morning, this text at American, where Mike and Elizabeth pastor. Before we get to the text, I want to give you a little bit of background on Psalm 84. The, the psalm is expressing the a joy of a pilgrim traveling to Jerusalem. They go up into the temple, and, and they're celebrating one of the feasts. And the psalm is a song of loving and longing for the presence of Yahweh. Charles Spurgeon said that Psalm 84 was entitled to be called the Pearl of the Psalms, which is actually fitting because my grandmother's name is Pearl. In the 23rd Psalm, if it was to be the most popular and the 103rd Psalm to be the most joyful, the 119th the most deeply experiential, the 51st the most plaintive, this one would be the sweet Psalm of Peace. And so as we come to the passage today, may we be reminded of the sweet psalm of peace. Hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you, whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs, and the early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is sun and shield, and he bestows favor and honor, and no good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. This is the word of the Lord. So I like to travel, and I have taken quite a few different journeys in my life. There have been many stamps in my passport, and I have traveled by train, and, and by bike, and by car, and by plane, and many times by foot. But many of you maybe who travel, if you know, sometimes the journey isn't always easy, and we're all on different journeys with different stops and detours, but we all have the same ultimate destination. When I like to think of destinations and different ways to get there, I often think of times in Colorado with, with Pikes Peak or climbing Mount Elbert, or my time at Mount Carmel in Israel. This is a picture from a distance of Mount Carmel, and you can see it's quite the, the trek up. And on the one side, you can, you can see how happy I was to get to the top. The ironic thing is, is we were dropped off at the bottom and we had to climb through some pieces of thorns that hurt our legs. We had to go over places and work in teamwork because they were digging a huge crevice and we had to heist and get everyone over it. We weaved and worked our way to the top and much to my excitement we got there, but then we climbed over a fence and there was a parking lot on the other side where everyone else drove up the back side of Mount Carmel to get there. I think like in Psalm 84, part of our journey is trusting the steps. There's distant, different destinations to get there. Ours was a lot harder. I had a lot more pain. And some people drove up the back side. But we all have set our eyes and hearts on the end goal of dwelling with God. We all set our eyes and hearts on getting to the top of the mountain. It's evident in the psalm that the writer longed to get away from, from the bustling world to meet God. 
We can feel the joy and the excitement for the writer as he starts to get to its destination. It's that person on the plane that, that's, or at the rest stop that's so excited for vacation or so excited for, for warm weather or so excited to see family. Or maybe it's that person like me that you've been away for a while and you're so excited to get back home. The desire to get home or to a vacation destination pales in comparison, though, to the excitement and expectation for those journeying in this passage to the presence of God. These words cover the range of desires from like to can't live without. It's this emotional and physical way that the writer describes his love for God and deep desire to be near him. His heart his inner being, and his flesh, his outer being. Just look at the language that's used here. The the soul longs. Some versions say yearns. Indeed, it faints. It sings for joy. This yearning acknowledges some desire. Yeah, I want that. Faint means being consumed by or, or swallowed up in. When we sing for joy, we're crying out with an expression of joy and praise and jubilation. I can just picture the psalmist writing and singing and saying, I want you, God. No way, I want you more than anything, God. I can't think of anything else. Waiting to be near you has eclipsed every other desire in me. I have got to get to where you are. I want to be near you. We can feel in this passage the great longing, the the soul and heart and flesh. All of the writer are involved in this longing. The longing to be more fully in God's presence. It's a hunger and a thirst, a soul that longs for the presence of Yahweh. It's in the yearning and desire for God in verses 1 through 4 that help the writer and us fix our eyes on Jesus. As they journey and as we journey, we keep saying, I want you, God. I need you, God. I want you more than anything, God. It's in the fainting and it's in the yearning and the deep longing for God that's going to be needed to keep journeying in verses 5 through 7. As Spurgeon said, it was a sweet psalm of peace. St. Augustine observed that the psalm contrasts the peace of God's presence with the turmoil of our present human condition. We have peace in God's presence even amidst the turmoil of our lives. I've heard quite a few people say similar things the last week. People who have felt peace in their lives even amidst the pain of death the pain of grief, and the pain of turmoil in their life. Psalm 84, verses 5 through 7, is where the journey gets hard. The pilgrim, the pilgrimage to the temple passes through the barren valley of Baca. The Hebrew word Baca means weep. The psalmist uses this valley of Baca to illustrate times of struggle to illustrate times of difficulty, to the tears through which people must pass on their way to meet God. I often wonder if this was one of the reasons it was one of my grandmother's favorite psalms so much. She saw her fair share of difficulty and pain in her life, raising five kids, walking with a husband through cancer, which eventually took his life, her own battle with cancer twice, or maybe it was her 14 grandchildren. Just a disclaimer, that was not me. I was not the difficulty or struggle. But she did see her fair share of the Valley of Baca on her way to meet God. For many of us, we do too. Maybe you think of a time when you've traveled through your own Valley of Baca. Maybe you find yourself in one right now. Those times in our lives when we experience the sorrow and we can't find the strength to do it on our own. 
As hard and as painful as the valley of Baca can be, we yearn and faint for the Lord. We can see our adversity as an opportunity to re-experience God's faithfulness. The valley of Baca may be, just maybe a different place. As it continues to say in verse 6, the valley of Baca, they made it a place of springs. The early rain covers it with pools, and the valley of Baca turns into springs of blessing and pools of refreshment. The verb in verse 6 says, says makes it. Makes it is an extremely strong verb. Makes it is like meaning, yes, God will deliver us, and God has the power to change my circumstances. In, in the dry and the lament and the barrenness of the valley of Baca, how do we make room for God's deliverance and his answers? A person walking through the valley begins to dig ditches like cisterns to hold the rain and dig down to find water. Some scholars say that this digging into barren, dry valley floor could even open up the ground for God to do a miracle by releasing spring fountain of comfort or blessing. God will then bring the early rain in the autumn to cover the cisterns that were dug and create pools in the desert. What a change, going from a dry and sterile and hopeless valley of Baca to a place drenched with pools in complete turnaround in circumstances. I think when we find ourselves in the valley of Baca, what does digging look like for you? Is it digging deeper into God's word? Is it digging into a unrushed prayer time with God? Maybe it's a simple song or time of worship, even when your voice feels weak or uninspired. A simple prayer for the minute or for the hour or for the day, just asking God to fill your pool and make a tiny, small fountain appear to drench your parched and weary soul and saturate your longing. There have been times in my life when I haven't felt like digging. I was tired. I was weary. I asked myself if the digging was even worth it. But what I realized was in those moments, it's when I needed to dig even more. In the Valley of Baca was when I needed to dig and run and get my shovel and dig faster and harder. Because God's early rain, the gift of himself, is coming. It always does, whether it's on this side of heaven or on when we get there. But the psalmist doesn't end leaving us in the valley of Baca. Actually, the passage says it says we pass through the valley of Baca. Pass through, which means we don't dwell there. We don't have to stay there or live there. We dwell in the house of the Lord. We pass through the valley of Baca. We live in the love and care of God, even in the hard places. And God is really good at healing the broken places in our lives. God can make all things beautiful, even in the Valley of Baca. The travelers journeyed from strength to strength. This idea meaning that something like the closer they get, the stronger they become. God's strength is our energy and endurance for, for the marathon journey of faith. We are not strong enough to be able to do it on our own to reach the destination. We will not achieve God's calling for our lives without God's help. We have to rely on God's strength for this journey. The life of a pilgrim isn't simply about arriving at our long-awaited destination when we die. It's about going from strength to strength, faithfully bringing the peace and the presence of God to all the hurting places and people. Think again about the Valley of Baca moments, maybe that you've experienced in your life. The digging that you did in the barren dry ground. 
Now think of those that maybe are in the valley with you and can't dig. What would it look like to bless them? Think about those maybe who are going to be coming after you through the valley of Baca. People maybe who need the pools that you have already dug of refreshment for them. Maybe you aren't in the valley today and, and your journey every day, it, is, it seems okay. But how can the refreshing rain that you find yourself be a refreshment and encouragement to others? As we journey every day, we live, we shouldn't choose our journey for ourselves and what is most pleasing to us, but, but rather we journey in a way that is most pleasing and honoring to God and those around us. Someone who experienced the pain of the Valley of Baca and yet found peace in God is Helen Rosavire, a medical missionary to the Belgian Congo. She experienced much suffering in her life, and she offers an interesting perspective on the question, why does God, a God of love, allow suffering? Helen corrects the goal reaction of why to instead asking, is he worthy? She explains it turns the whole thing around. Instead of looking at a price we think we have to pay, we're thinking of a privilege God wants us wants to give. And always the answer is yes. God is worthy. Is God worthy? Yes, he is. Does it mean we're always going to understand our valleys and our disappointments? No. But instead of being surprised by our times in the Valley of Baca, we could expect it as the Lord's training and refining process, rejoicing in the privilege of sharing in Christ's suffering. I know that's a hard perspective to grasp, especially when you find yourself in the valley. But C.S. Lewis says, pain is the megaphone to the deaf world. God doesn't waste the gift of pain. God won't waste our time or our gift of pain either. Psalm 84 confirms the the certainty of earthly suffering, but reminds us of the promise of future glory. The pilgrims in the psalm may have to pass through many a valley of weeping and many a, a desert But wells of salvation shall be opened up for us. When we pass, press forward on our Christian journey, we shall find God adds grace to our graces. He adds grace to our graces. Which brings us to the final section of this great psalm. In verses 9 through 12, we see the pilgrimage was a journey of contentment and joy, even through the valley of Baca. The travelers reach their destination and they find their presence of God everything they could have imagined. Have you ever looked forward to something so much and and once it comes, it turns out to be even better than you thought? I imagine that this was what it was like for the traveler in Psalm 84. I wonder if they didn't just say, "Ah, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I don't imagine them saying that, but rather they shouted it at the top of their lungs. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Not wanting to trade a day in God's presence for anything on earth. Right? I have a bucket list of destinations of places I would still like to visit but all of, the, all of these places are really cool, and places maybe you visited or want to visit are really cool, yet this traveler is saying, I would rather spend just one day, just one day, in God's presence over and above any place or anything else. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Meaning, I would rather take the the lowest position in God's house above anything else that the world can offer. He has seen what the world has to, to offer and realized nothing else satisfies. 
What a joy can be found in God's presence. What more could any of us want as a traveler? And just like the travelers in Psalm 84, it's only when Jesus is firmly established on the throne of our lives that we will be safe throughout the journey. It's only when we know in each of our own lives that Jesus is firmly established on the throne that we will be safe on our journey. God is watching each of our journeys, empowering us with hope each day. The final joy of our destination makes our current struggle worth it. Our pilgrimage is not the Valley of Baca. It's not the final destination. The Valley of Baca is also not our home. We are only passing through. Recently, I read this by author and speaker Lisa Turkhurst, which she posted, and it really resonates with so much of Psalm 84. She said, There's no part of me that wants sorrow to be included in in my journey or in yours. But the longer I walk with the Lord, the more I see the picking and choosing what gets to be part of our stories would keep us from the ultimate good God has in mind. Our understanding of joy rises or falls on whether we truly trust God in the middle of what our human minds can't see as good at all. It's hard. So she says, I like to think of it in terms of baking. Imagine if we decided to make a cake from scratch today. After going to the store, we we set out all the ingredients. We have the flour, and we have the butter, and we have the sugar, and we have the vanilla, and the eggs, and the baking powder, and a pinch of salt. But then maybe we felt too tired to actually mix it all together and make the cake. So instead, we thought we could just enjoy the cake one ingredient at a time. Things we don't like, some of the individual ingredients, so we would just leave them out. The flour's too dry, so I'm just going to leave that out. The sugar and the butter and vanilla, those are really good, so we're going to leave those in. The eggs are just gross raw, so we're going to definitely leave those out. And then our cake would never be made. I think we're so quick to judge the quality of our life's journey and reliability of God based on individual events rather than the eventual good of God working together. We must know that just like the master baker has reasons to allow flour and eggs in the right measure into the recipe. Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, will do the same with our dry and hard times. Wanting to leave eggs and flour out. We want to leave the pain and the hardship and the weariness and the questions out. We want the sweet moments and the good moments and the happy moments. But unfortunately, that's not how life works. And so we sit with and tend to all that still needs to be healed. And at the same time, we laugh. We plan with great things ahead and to cl- declare the glorious, this is a glorious day. Our sorrows make our hearts more tender and allow us to grieve. Our celebrations tend to our hearts and need to recognize what is beautiful about our life and get back up and go on. One of the, th- the quotes that has been really present to me in the last six months is, true maturity is uh, holding grief in one hand and gratitude in the other and being stretched by them both. There's moments where we grieve our lives, yet we also have gratitude, and we're stretched by both of them. So whether we find ourselves in the valley or the mountaintop, we, let's embrace the mix of all that's worthy of celebration while fully allowing sorrow to add what it brings as well as knowing that we can trust Jesus' recipe of purpose in both pain and the joy. Each of us are a pilgrim on a a journey of discipleship with Christ, and no matter where we find ourselves on the journey of faith today, 
whether it is hurt from a time in the valley of Baca, or you find yourself on the mountaintop, or you find yourself, you are still in the valley of Baca, in the good and the bad, in the blessing and the hardship. They're all sourced in God's grace. There is nothing greater, nothing that can bring more peace in turmoil, nothing that can bring more joy than souls that long for souls that long for Yahweh. It is only in Yahweh where our souls will be satisfied and we will find the strength to continue on our journey towards an eternity with God. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God, you teach us to seek, to see you in your dwelling place. God, let that be our heartbeat, to behold your beauty in your sanctuary. Let our soul faint only in an effort to see your heavenly places. God, anoint us with the joy of your constant presence and make our strength come from you and you alone, God. God, we pray today for those moments of gratitude, for the joys that we have, for for new life, for new relationships, for laughter that comes easily, for crisp fall days, for home-cooked meals, who people who know our names. God, we thank you for this congregation and ministry and mission. But God, we also know that we bring you prayers of grief. God, we find some of us maybe find ourselves in Valley of Baca moments. We pray for healing on the earth. We, we pray for justice in our world. We pray for the poor and the oppressed, God. For loved ones who are caught in endless cycles of depression or anxiety. For those who are grieving and lonely. For those who are desperate for an ounce of good news. God, we, we ask that you please send rain to our deserts and valleys and make springs where there was only dust and waste. God, each day we go from strength to strength, empowered by you. So whether we find ourselves on the mountaintop or in the valley of Baca or somewhere in between, God, we trust you. We trust you to draw near. We trust you to hear our prayers. God, help us to be future-minded with a now impact. And as we continue to see reminders of you in our every day, we will continue to pray the words that your Son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Kristen. Um, We have one additional prayer request this morning. We offer our sympathy to Paul Yin, his wife, and their daughter, Maria, the passing of Paul's father yesterday. Um, This passing is especially difficult given that Paul's father lived in China and they are not able to return there at this time. So um, let's keep Paul and Jenny and Maria in our prayers. We come to the portion of the service that for me feels awkward and clunky as I present it. because I sometimes don't know how to talk about what giving means with my own children. But when I think about um, giving our tithes and offerings, I think about investing in community. Think about the fact that we have an opportunity to surround each other while we're going through hard times. And I think about the fact that we get to surround each other through fun and Laughter, like Advent opportunities, which can be found on the back of your bulletin. Um, There are a couple of dates, I'm going to take a side note here, to um, just correct in that the Strings Ensemble will rehearse for 14 
on Saturday, December 17. Um, <clears throat> also, one I just want to highlight is the Christmas choir because it didn't make it on the back of the bulletin yesterday. So if you are interested in having some fun in our community together as we prepare for the holiday season, I invite you to check out the Advent opportunities in the back. And Lizzie says you can even sign up today um, if you want to be a part of the All Ages and Stages Christmas program, which will be on December 18. Um, <clears throat> And then another thing I love about this community and our communal investment is that it also invites us to invest outward into the greater community in organizations that we participate in here in Orange City, but also supporting missionaries, some of whom are um, people who used to worship here in this place with us, like John and Lynn Hubers and Ethan Denise Krebs. So... Um, I, I like this moment because it also reminds me that giving of my tithe, giving my offering, is a communal act, something that we do together. And so as a community, we rise together and we sing as we give our tithes and offerings at this time. continue responding to God by singing hymn number 367, Day by Day.
as you go into this week, may you go with this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit go with you. Go in peace.